free legal advice on the internet is, shall we say, bad. And unfortunately, some of the worst takes come from one of my favorite places on the internet, Reddit's r slash legal advice. And of course, on the other hand, anyone with an internet connection knows the best headlines always begin with Florida man. So what happens when you combine the subreddit legal advice and Florida? Well, it gets interesting. And today's episode of Bad Legal Advice comes from Reddit user Clean Transportation, who shares her own Florida man story. She writes, Regular customer tipped me scratch tickets for years. I finally won something, and they're threatening legal action because I don't want to give them a cut. Florida. <laughs> of course. I worked as head bartender for a local restaurant for a number of years, and there was a regular customer who was there very frequently. I interacted with his customer frequently. They tipped exclusively in scratch tickets and specifically called to ask for my schedule, asked me out on multiple occasions, etc. Probably about 40 years my senior. If you've ever watched The Good Place, this guy is IRL Brent. It's all about taking personal responsibility. I don't know if people do that. Now, okay, so this isn't exactly legal advice, but just general life advice. Please don't ask out your bartenders who were just working. Don't mistake their professional courtesy for genuine interest. And if a person has already said they aren't interested in the first time, they typically aren't charmed if you ask them repeatedly. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but 80s movies kind of lied to you. Persistence in the face of no isn't romantic. In this day and age, it's creepy. So come on, let's just not do that. But. I digress, back to the post. I won something from the scratch ticket that wasn't five, ten dollars The final amount after taxes was about three months salary for me and I was making good money. I specifically didn't tell the customer, not because I thought they would want it, but because I didn't want them feeling like I owed them something or that I should be thankful towards them. I did tell a coworker and it got to him through the grapevine. Next time I came in, he congratulated me and asked me how we wanted to split it. I sternly told him that it was my tip and long story short, he went to my manager who took his side. I quit, had been planning to anyway since I'm about to finish school. My manager gave this guy my email. I'm curious about the legality of this too. And he, the customer, emailed me saying that if I didn't agree to give him 50%, he'd take legal action. So here we have a female employee dealing with a bar patron who has repeatedly declared a romantic interest in her, which is not reciprocal, threatens a lawsuit over a tip ticket. And after all of that, the manager gives the bar patron her email address. This is what we call in the legal profession, a total move. It's also the same in bird culture but this probably isn't illegal. I know this isn't the main part of the story, but she's asking for legal advice here and I just have to sink my teeth into this one. So aside from information classified as confidential, like an employee's medical history, the disclosure of most employee personal information to third parties is largely unregulated. Many employers regularly share their employees' personal information with third party vendors to run background checks, to outsource administrative functions and so on. And Florida, which does have a right to privacy written into its state constitution, does not have any specific laws that would prevent an employer from providing an employee's personal information. And Florida laws against invasion of privacy, like intrusion or publication of private facts, typically require showing that the disclosure of such information is offensive or goes beyond all possible bounds of decency. So it's not clear that the manager giving out an employee's email to a patron, even one threatening to sue her, meets the offensiveness standard. And finally, another standard caveat when I do these things, this could totally be fake. I don't know. This could be completely made up. I don't really care. This is fun to talk about. It's an interesting legal issue. But anyway, back to the putative Reddit post. Do I need to worry about taking his threat seriously? Is there anything that I can or should do to protect myself? I'm assuming this is a bluff, but I want to have my bases covered. TLDR, me drink lady, mean man who buy many drinks, give me a scratchy, scratchy, okay, we get it. So she is worried that this guy is going to sue her for some or all of the lottery winnings. And this can be a complicated issue. Believe me, anytime the lottery is involved, lawyers are not far behind. There is a long history of lottery law out there. But before we dive into this complicated legal mess, let's check in with the comments to see if any of these Redditors offered some good legal advice. And in fact, X Shady writes, mm, mm, like green paper, ung um, buy dizzy drink with green paper, ung um, happy. Yeah, so that's pretty much about the quality of legal advice that you're likely to get when you ask for free advice on the internet. It's basically random postings from the unfrozen caveman lawyer. Your world frightens and confuses me. And that might be reason enough alone for this Redditor to retain counsel, because in America, of course, you can sue anyone at any time over just about anything. And even if a lawsuit is completely meritless, you still have to defend the case. But here, since the unfrozen 
frozen caveman lawyer is unavailable, RIP Phil Hartman, this Redditor could hire a lottery lawyer. Yes, that's right. There actually is a thing called lottery law. A lottery lawyer can help navigate tax laws, keep your identity anonymous when you claim your prize and defend you from potential lawsuits over the winnings like this potential lawsuit. Because winning the lottery can turn into a messy battle that ruins friendships, tears apart families and explodes into costly lawsuits. And this is especially the case where you have the dreaded workplace lottery pools. For example, in 2012, 12 coworkers in Illinois won $118 million and they were sued by 11 of their other colleagues who claimed that they were in the pool and demanded a share. It took three years and six law firms to settle the case with the original 12 getting $6 million each and six others splitting $13.8 million. But no one got a penny of that until the case was resolved. And similarly in 2009, five construction workers in a lottery pool sued when the sixth coworker took a $38.5 million jackpot, quit his job, and then disappeared. A judge ordered the defendant to surrender $20 million to the five former coworkers. That's why lottery lawyers recommend all workplace lottery pools have a sharing agreement in writing. Because just like Biggie says, mo financial remuneration, mo judicial proceedings and legal ramifications. But let's dive back into the comments. Maybe there's something else that's better in here. For example, sign up accounts writes, if you get sued, then you'll need to show up and comply with any judge's orders. Fair enough. But right now you owe him nothing and don't even have a responsibility to reply to his emails. Do save them just in case you get sued though. But if he is threatening litigation, I would recommend ceasing all contact from this point forward without an attorney present. And this is technically correct. You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. Typically, you have no legal obligation to respond to pre-litigation demand letters threatening a lawsuit. And if the bar patron hasn't even retained a lawyer, this could just be an empty threat. And then another Redditor, Meowzebub, chimes in helpfully. And just to clarify why this is important, if this guy files a lawsuit against the Redditor, which he is completely entitled to do regardless of the lack of legal basis for the claim, she needs to show up or be ruled against by default. And these comments are interesting because they're not really getting to the heart of the substantive issue, but they're really interested in civil procedure and you know, they're not wrong. And it's important to note that a plaintiff isn't entitled to file a meritless lawsuit. If a plaintiff files a lawsuit that they know has no legal basis whatsoever, they can be subject to sanctions. But as we see time and time again, people will often file these meritless suits and avoid sanctions because it's rare for judges to take that extra step. And it's hard to weed out the uh, lawsuits that have merit from the ones that are completely meritless at the first stages. But Meowzebub, who has a hilarious username, does make a very important point. Even if the case is complete nonsense, you still have to defend yourself from the lawsuit. Otherwise you could lose automatically by default. I guess you're the winner by default. Default! When a person is sued and served with an official court summons and a complaint, the defendant only has a limited amount of time to file a response, either what's called a motion to dismiss or a formal answer to the complaint. If a defendant fails to file any response or otherwise abandons the case, the plaintiff can request the court enter what's called a default judgment against the absentee defendant. So that's why it's so incredibly important to be actually represented by counsel if you are formally sued. But back to the crux of this Reddit post, the central question is whether there is an enforceable contract between the bar patron and the bartender to split the ticket winnings. And this is really important because most people assume that a contract has to be written, but that's actually not the case. Only a small number of contracts must be in writing. And in fact, sometimes there can even be an implied contract based on the actions of the individuals. So it's not nearly as cut and dry as it would appear. In fact, generally speaking, a contract doesn't have to be in writing to be enforceable as both written contracts and oral contracts can be valid. In fact, most lottery lawsuits are based exclusively on oral agreements to share winnings because people don't often write down their contracts and you know, that keeps lawyers employed. But all enforceable contracts must have an offer, an acceptance of that offer and consideration. An offer is usually a specific proposal to enter into an agreement with another. Acceptance of that offer is an assent to the bargain, which can either be expressed like signing an agreement or implied by conduct. And consideration is performance or a return promise for which the party to the contract has bargained. In order to constitute a bargain for consideration, both sides must negotiate some benefit and or detriment from one another in exchange for the promises to perform. However, 
A gift promise, like a tip, lacks these required elements. When you promise someone a gift, there's no formal offer. There's no offer to accept and there's no consideration. A gift promise is not an invitation to bargain because the promisor is offering something without demanding anything in return. Since no exchange is sought by the promising party, there's no consideration. So for example, a court would not enforce a bare promise to a friend that if the promisor ever won the lottery, then the lottery winnings would be shared equally between the friends. Thus, a gift promise doesn't create an enforceable contract. And this was essentially the conclusion of a lawsuit against Tonda Dickerson, an Alabama Waffle House waitress who received a Florida lottery ticket as a tip that won $10 million. Two years after winning, Edward Seward, the man who left the lottery ticket as a tip, sued Dickerson and her coworkers to recover the entire $10 million prize. In his complaint, Seward alleged Dickerson had promised to buy him a truck with any lottery winnings. She didn't do that, and thus Seward was uh, claiming to be a victim of fraudulent misrepresentation. But instead of seeking to recover just the truck, Seward demanded that the court invalidate the tip on the grounds of fraud and award him the entire $10 million lottery winnings. The trial court ruled against Seward, holding that the tipped ticket was an unconditional gift and found no evidence of fraud. And in support of their ruling, the court found that Dickerson had made no misrepresentations to Seward before she received the lottery ticket. Seward gave Dickerson the ticket without previously discussing what would happen if she won, not on this occasion, nor on any previous occasion of tipping the Waffle House employees with lottery tickets, and Dickerson never requested a lottery ticket from Seward, rather he just gave it to her freely and without expectation. And of course, Seward did not limit his damages to the claim that he was entitled to a new truck, but was claiming the entire $10 million prize, which, you know, probably didn't help his case all that much. Seward appealed his case to the Alabama Supreme Court and lost. So this Reddit case seems to be pretty similar to the Seward case. Both Seward and the Reddit bar patron had a pattern of leaving lottery tickets as tips for servers. There's no indication that either patron discussed sharing the proceeds from winning tickets with their servers. And there's no indication that the servers fraudulently misrepresented that they would share the winnings to induce the patrons to leave the lottery tickets as a tip. So based on these facts, it doesn't seem like the bar patron has any right to share in the Redditor's winnings. Now, Maybe the Redditor is holding back. If there was a discussion, if there was an oral contract, that could change the facts of this case. By the way, this is what lawyers do all the time. We analogize to old cases and we analyze them in comparison to the cases before us. So whether it's Reddit or whether it is an actual lawsuit, this is the kind of stuff that we do every day. And there are certainly facts that this Redditor might have left out from the post that could change this outcome. But based on what we know, uh, I'm sorry to the bar patron, but you are not entitled to anything from the lottery winnings. But one way to feel like you've won the lottery is to get the perfect domain name for your website. And when I need a new domain, I go with today's sponsor, Hover. Maybe I should buy up a specialty website like LotteryLawyer.com and specialize in representing all the people who think that they're owed money from someone else's lottery win. Huge retainer required, obviously. Hover is the best place on the internet to get yourself a domain name, in part because they have over 400 extensions to choose from, ranging from .com, .io, .me, to .ninja, and .pizza. Seriously. You can even get .democrat or .republican for your website. I use Hover whenever I need a domain. For example, I got LegalEagle.tv and LegalEaglePrep.com for the website that helps law students. I highly recommend that everyone go get their name.com or the name of their business.com or .io or .whatever before it's gone. And with Hover, it is super easy to get a domain. There are no upsells, no annoying pop-ups, and if you have an account like I do, you can get another domain in less than 30 seconds. Or just check to see if that website is still available. And once you've got your domain, Hover makes it incredibly easy to set up a professional email address. Even if you don't want to set up a website, you can still get professional email because you never want to be that person that uses an AOL or Earthlink email address in 2021. Don't be Stephen Biss. Of course, the best part is that if you go over to hover.com slash legal eagle, which you can find in the description below, you'll get 10% off your entire order. Again, just go to hover.com slash legal eagle or click on the link in the description to get 10% off of your entire order. Plus, clicking on the link really helps out this channel. So, do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here where I tackle all the things that people get wrong about the law on the internet, including and especially on Reddit. So, click on this playlist or I'll see you in court.